thank you very much to the college for the invitation to talk to you today. Um, so that's me. I'm a clinical anaesthetist, but also undertaking research at Cranfield University Shrivenham site with the Impact and Armour Department, uh, which would explain my interest in gelatin and silicone. This is a photograph taken in 2009 at the field hospital in Camp Bastion in Afghanistan, a photograph taken by my colleague Colonel Simon Orr, who was the commander at the time of the hospital and indeed the entire medical group. And this is an operating theatre. And what you can see in the operating theatre is three surgical teams working on one patient, working simultaneously to manage the horrendous injuries that we were seeing from complex, uh, ex complex explosive events associated with improvised explosive devices. Now to do this effectively and to work towards a common goal, you need a common understanding of the injury mechanisms and you need to be communicating and collaborating as individuals. So how do we get to this point? Let's go back to some basic research. So on this slide, I've offered you a number of images. If we look at the top left-hand side of the picture as you're looking at it, you can see some yellow blocks. These are gelatin blocks. And this is an early sequence of a bullet impact on gelatin blocks. And what you can see, the bullet is about to impact. And then you can see it starting to tumble as it comes into the block at the bottom. I put this up because this is one of the early sequences that I saw when I was undertaking my early education in, in ballistic injury in the uh, early to mid 80s. Now the block here I'm particularly proud of, this is one of mine, the one at the bottom. And if I could have a show of hands, who's ever made jelly? Yep. You've all made jelly, we're on the same page. <laughs> However, my jelly box are 32 kilograms. And it takes me all day on a Tuesday <laughs> to make six blocks. So what you have to do, you get, you get big sacks of ballistic grade photographic gelatin. And it's sort of like, uh, like couscous, dry couscous. And because we need, a particular, um, we need a particular mass of the gelatin, so the block has, has particular properties. So I'm after 10% gelatin. So I'll weigh that out, 3.2 kilograms. And then with a colleague, because it's a two-person procedure, dissolve it bit by bit in a big vat, stir it round, and you have to get the temperature right. If it's too uh, warm initially, it just clumps, and you actually degrade the, the structure. If it's too cold, it doesn't, doesn't like dissolving. So jar, jugs, buckets, stir, 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 and eventually get, you get a nice mix. And you want a nice mix, and you then debubble it with, um, with cinnamon oil, which ta helps take the bubbles out. And if you get a nice mix, you get a nice, uh, well, a nice block with optical properties. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to three things on the block. First of all, the scale. When you're doing this, you need forensic scale, so you can relate, relate the events you see in the block to a time course. And what I've done in this block, it's actually been sectioned and you're seeing part of a ballistic tract. The tract at the top is the permanent tract that has been left in the gelatin by the bullet's passage. And that's got food dye in it, black food colouring, so we can actually see the tract more easily. I have a set of clothing at Shrivenham now covered in black food colouring because it's not a particularly straightforward process. It makes nice photographs, but syringing it in, <laughs> it's a messy business. Can you see there's a ball bearing underneath here as well in its own little tract? That's a 5.5 millimetre ball bearing. We fire these at the gelatin blocks before we fire the bullet because you have to calibrate your blocks. You have to understand if the block that you've got is behaving the same as your previous blocks and behaving the same as the blocks that are reported in the literature. So this is one you can see it's a calibration shot and then I measure that with a big piece of wire, measure it how far it's gone in against the long ruler and then that tells me with, an a, with a chart we've got of previous calibrations that the block I've got is behaving like 10% gelatin and the view is that 10% gelatin is close to, to muscle. Look up 
and we have the imposition of a gelatin block trace of both the temporary cavity and the permanent cavity onto a, an individual. And that different bullets produce different traces. And uh, clearly we're not made of gelatin. But surprisingly we do behave a bit like gelatin under ballistic, under ballistic conditions. So even though we don't behave entirely like gelatin, it's a useful construct by which we can understand ballistic events and take that construct to teach our people about how bullets behave and interpret the injury patterns they see in front of that um, and in turn we can use those to develop our treatment algorithms. Treatment algorithms. So, gelatin ballistic type research is just one element of our research strands. This is also taken in Afghanistan, standing in front of a Royal Air Force CH-47 Chinook, which was the helicopter that would deliver the medical emergency response team to do battlefield casualty recovery, which is my role on the last three tours in Afghanistan. And we've got two documents. The first one is our clinical guidelines for operations. And that's sort of a, a, um, a handbook, a culmination of our operational and research experience to give everyone fairly straightforward algorithms about how to manage particular injuries. And the second one is our version of the Advanced Trauma Life Support Course. It's the Battlefield Advanced Trauma Life Support Course. And that has gone through a number of iterations as our experience of blast and ballistic injury changed during the course of the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. And as we went right round the loop in terms of investigating novel and emerging injury mechanisms, pressure tested them experimentally, then working out both mitigation and treatment protocols. And I just like this because I found these two little books battered and well thumbed within our little hut that we lived in when we were doing the, doing the job of the, of, of the MERT. And I'm really, really pleased because it's like closing the loop. Research had done that. And here we have our little books out there being used by the individuals who are rolling in the dirt looking after our casualties. So very pleasing. OK. How does that come together for us as trauma anaesthetists? And how, how would it be of interest to this audience, predominantly anaesthetists? Well, the treatment algorithms have allowed us to achieve a population of unexpected survivors. We were faced in both Iraq and particularly in Afghanistan with very, very badly injured people, people hurt from blast and ballistic mechanisms. Now, as you all appreciate, when you've got someone who's badly injured and has lost a lot of blood, they present to you coagulopathic. And they present to you with both significant tissue loss and other significant injuries affecting ventilation, affecting airway management, and affecting our management of the whole patient. So by the same sort of team training and team approach that I described earlier on that was, led in that, that was underpinned by the clinical guidelines for operations and the battlefield advanced trauma life support, we were able to get a population of these badly injured people to become survivors. And they were managed in the environment that you saw in the first slide. That meant massive blood transfusions. It meant holding within the field large amounts of blood and plasma brought in from the UK, supplied by the blood transfusion service, effectively coming in on regular aircraft loads, coming into us and becoming part of our, our resuscitation protocol. We also had platelets. We were supported by regular flights providing fresh platelets and we had cryoprecipitate. Now that's a heady mix when you're dealing with the environment I showed you in the initial slide, all these teams working together, and we needed guidance. We're very fortunate we're also able to deploy near patient testing. And we developed a very active program of near patient testing for coagulopathy <coughs> and became competent at managing the coagulation defects that we all see in major trauma. Now, clearly, there are other things we do as well. We warm the patient, and we generally improve their overall conditions and the environment we're looking after them in. But near patient testing made a tremendous difference. Allowed us to manage the coagulopathy, and then in turn, allowed us to give appropriate pain relief. And the deployment 
of ultrasound systems within our field hospitals allowed us to improve and develop our skill sets of placing appropriate regional anesthesia in the battle space so that we could manage the pain of our patients appropriately both within the field hospital and the long trip back from Afghanistan with the Royal Air Force back to the UK and ultimately into Birmingham. And you can see here is a good example, a lot of our injuries were of were limb injuries, both upper arm and lower limb, because the core of the body is generally protected by the type of protective systems that we wear. And being able to have an individual with an indwelling nerve catheter receiving an ongoing infusion of local anaesthetic during the evacuation transformed the way we managed our patients. And to me, this was the sort of culmination of combat anaesthesia as a speciality, blending our resuscitation, blending our management of coagulopathy, and bringing to bear the uh, resources of modern anaesthesia in the battle space to improve the care of our patients. So that was gelatin and the role that gelatin has taken, understanding ballistic injury, to bring us to patient care. How about silicone, or should it be silicon? Well, I think it's both. Let me introduce you to a number of research projects that we're currently involved in. Can I reassure you, for the sake of the talk, I haven't cut someone's heart out, <laughs> although it may look like that. This is a 3D printed organ made of silicon and belongs to the gentleman, as you look up here, you can see on the, on the right hand side. He's disturbingly realistic. The body, the shell, is made by a UK company called Trauma FX, based up in North Yorkshire. And for a long time, they've been providing us in the military very, very realistic <coughs> mannequins made from human casts, uh, living human casts, volunteers, to produce um, realistic silicone models. And we've used them both for trauma and for the Ebola crisis. So we had ones that would be uh, made up as trauma victims. And in the Ebola crisis, we had ones that we could work on when we were in our um, biological suits to understand the handling and management of these patients in the appropriate uh, biocontrolled environment. Now we've taken this a little stage further, working with Nottingham Trent University where they have a design center that has traditional crafts, where they uh, work a lot with materials and are involved in clothing science. So they presented us with this silicon heart and said, what do you think we could do with this? And we've taken that on to this gentleman, whereby we now have this patient, this patient, this dolly, has lungs, heart, and an aorta, and a diaphragm and when attached to a ventilator or an ambu bag will breathe appropriately, look horribly realistic, and you can open him along emergency thoracotomy cut lines. We're in process of sorting out the bleeding so we can disturb our surgical teams correctly. But the nice thing is you can reseal him. A little bit of silicon paste, a bit of glue, and you can put him all back together. <laughs> and if someone's nicked the lung or nicked the heart, they can't sew it back up, we can pop another one back in. And we wanted a very realistic training simulator that we could take anywhere and put them into realistic austere environments to give our people, give the next generation coming through, the right understanding of the conflict and combat environment and give them the right attitudes and skills to be able to deliver the care appropriately within those environments. So that's silicone. How about silicon? These are virtual environments. We're working with the University of Birmingham to develop virtual environment trainers. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of, heard of virtual reality. We've all seen um, virtual reality films, Matrix, um, what's real, what isn't. Um, <coughs> what we've got here are examples of a number of the projects that we're involved with. So under Professor Bob Stone, his team have developed this uh, tabletop trainer so what you see in the top picture, top left picture, is one of Professor Stone's research team wearing a headset. And if you walk in the room, what you see is this individual wearing a headset, looking at that blank table. What the individual sees is this environment here, 
uh, and they can sweep in and sweep out as you can on your smartphones and look at details and they can see little drones flying around and little helicopters flying around and they can pull down information and that information for us clinically it could be patient information, it could be hospital information, it could be routes in and routes out. And we're building this as a clinical trainer so our clinical teams can rehearse events, can rehearse the environment they're going to work in and have a good logistic understanding of what they're getting themselves into. Then we have our virtual trainer. <coughs> what you're looking at here is a virtual Chinook, uh, fully immersive. It's, it's put in a little tent so the individuals are confined so you don't walk out of the virtual environment and find yourself floating over Dartmoor. Um, but it's same right dimensions, has the right sound effects, and if you look out of the windows, you are indeed flying over Dartmoor. Now this is our early stage one, but the one we're building at the moment will have avatars that you interact with, both clinical and force protection, and superimposing the virtual patient on one of these high fidelity silicon models will give our people the right understanding of the environment they'll be working in but also allow them to experience the correct environment. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. We've come from the basics of gelatin blocks and how they allow us to understand holistic mechanisms. We've seen that is one pathway which takes us into our clinical guidelines. Our clinical guidelines underpin our clinical performance but we need to maintain that for our current and upcoming generation and we're actively exploring the role of both high fidelity simulation in silicone and in silica to give our people the right understanding of the environments that we're finding themselves working in. Thank you very much for your attention.